Hey everyone, you are listening to the Prairie Podcast. My name is Carson Bradley, and I am here with... My name is Chloe Reichel. Chloe, what are we going to be doing today? We are doing a deep dive of the Halloween franchise. That's right. With Halloween coming up, there is no film franchise that is more synonymous with the holiday of Halloween than the Halloween series. Mm -hmm. And with the release of the recent Halloween Ends on October 13th, this this year 2022 that marks the 13th film in the franchise and it is it just makes it so apparent that the series the 44 year long series has repeated the same mistake and now at this point it's time to let this series die Halloween ends open to not even divisive reception between critics and audiences alike, but almost unanimous disdain. With a Rotten Tomato score currently sitting at a 41% and a Metacritic score sitting at a 46, film critic Candace McMillan says, Halloween ends is more of a mercy killing than a glorious cinematic redemption for the previous film. More bitter than sweet given the anticlimactic ending. What exactly is it? What is it about Halloween Ends that makes me say that it's time for the series to meet its end? And what is the over 40 year long pattern that just can't seem to be broken? That is what we are going to be talking about. After viewing Halloween Ends, we decided to rewatch all 12 of the previous films in the franchise and do a deep dive of each film discussing what we liked, what we disliked, and really figure out just what this pattern is. This podcast will contain spoilers for the new film as well as the rest of the series. We will also be discussing events that occur in the films that it may be offensive or disturbing as the series is about a deranged serial killer and much of the films contain graphic violence, unsurprisingly, but a fair warning never hurt anyone. So let's go back to the start. Halloween, released on October 27th, 1978, directed by John Carpenter, starring Donald Pleasance and introducing the world to the legendary Jamie Lee Curtis in the iconic role of Laurie Strode. It is so weird to see Jamie Lee Curtis as a teenager because our generation grew up with her as the mom in Freaky Friday. Exactly. So because of that, like we just see her as the mother character, the mother figure in a way. And that's not like her fault. Like she's proven that she's like, she's done so much in her career. Like she's a legend. She's broken out of that. She's there's nothing to break out of actually anyway. She's like an extremely versatile actress. It's, it's our fault. Yeah. It's our fault that we were born as a mom at the time that we were, it's our fault that we were born Mm -hmm. (laughs) on a budget of $325,000. The film grossed over 47 million at the box office. And when adjusted for inflation, makes it one of the most profitable independent films ever released. The film opens with a mysterious first person perspective single take set on Halloween night in 1963. As the perspective shot creeps through a house and follows a young girl going upstairs to her room, it is revealed that the perspective is from a boy named Michael as he murders his older sister. The scene doesn't end there. As Michael walks out of his home to find his parents, they take off his mask and the point of view shot ends, revealing Michael, just a young boy, holding a bloodstained knife, showing no remorse or any real emotions at all. The next scene flash forwards 15 years later, on October 30th, 1978. The scene introduces Donald Pleasanton's character, Dr. Sam Loomis, Michael's psychiatrist. The scene begins with Dr. Loomis being driven by a nurse to the medical hospital where Michael is being held in Smith's Grove, Illinois. The scene then shows an inmate, implied to be Michael. However, his face is obscured. He steals the car and makes his way home to Haddonfield. The next scene then takes place on the day of Halloween, where we are then introduced to Jamie Lee's character, Lori, a typical suburban Girl Scout who gets really good grades and doesn't pursue a promiscuous lifestyle like her character's friends. Although that seems unimportant now, it actually ends up being relevant later. Kind of. In a later scene where Lori and her friends are walking home from school, Lori has a strange feeling that they're being followed. She soon spots a man in a mechanic's coveralls and a plain white Halloween mask creeping near a hedge. Once they reach the hedge to see who or what was creeping, the man had already seemingly vanished. The creeping man in the scene is only implied to be Michael, as the audience isn't supposed to know quite yet who he is. Many other scenes in the first act do this exact thing, showcasing how quiet and subtle Michael is when he's stalking his prey. Aside from Michael stalking Lori and her friends, 
Another portion of the first act is also dedicated to Dr. Loomis trying to warn the police of what they have in store with Michael on the loose, especially with it being Halloween night, which perfectly sets up what Michael is capable of. In a later scene, Dr. Loomis speaks to the sheriff of the town and describes Michael as having a blank, pale, emotionless face, perfectly represented by the pale, emotionless mask. This character is the horror icon we all know today as Michael Myers. In the scene, Loomis describes the psyche of Myers with simplicity, which draws a line for the film not to cross. John Carpenter clearly knew that with this film, less was more. Loomis proceeds to say, I spent eight years trying to reach him, but then another seven trying to keep him locked up because I realized that what was living behind that boy's eyes was purely and simply evil. And that is it. That's all anyone needs to understand anything about Michael Myers. That's all the explanation needed. No need for anything more than that. Otherwise, it's no longer subtly haunting. It becomes too much and, and stupid. And that's the line John Carpenter drew for the film, not to cross. The reason this original film is still iconic is because there's so much one could expand upon with Michael Myers, but the fact that they don't, and he's just simply and purely evil, that's all we need to know. There is no reason for the lack of a soul or any consciousness. The unknown is much scarier and much more haunting. As for the rather huge impact this film had on cinema, it pioneered many tropes, for better or worse, that we still see in horror films today. As you said earlier, the fact that Lori is portrayed as not being as promiscuous as her friends are is somewhat relevant because she is the only one of her friends who isn't brutally murdered by Michael Myers. This coincidental aspect of the movie made so many other slasher films do the same thing. This trope is that characters who have sex in slasher films always die, and then the awkward ones who don't end up becoming the heroes of the film. This trope, unintentionally pioneered by Halloween, was addressed in the brilliant 1996 horror satire Scream, stating how in slasher movies the main virgin character is always the one who doesn't die and even sometimes ends up defeating the villain. Other than the haunting simplicity behind the main antagonist's design, the most iconic and impactful aspect of this movie is its score, more specifically the main title theme song. John Carpenter himself composed the score, citing his influences being the theme song from The Exorcist, titled Tubular Bells, as well as the works from the Italian rock band Goblin. John Carpenter stated in an interview that the rhythm was inspired by an exercise my father taught me on the bongos in 1961, the beating out of 5-4 time. And in that interview, he revealed that it took him only three days to compose the entire score for the film. For the main title theme, Carpenter reworked the bongos technique to the piano. To this day, it's still considered one of the best film scores of all time, and most would agree that it's the theme song for the holiday itself as it perfectly encapsulates the feeling of the time of year. I've always felt that the, admitted by John Carpenter himself, very simple score works so well with the very minimalistic approach to the film. Whether the minimalistic approach was done due to budgetary constraints, or if that was always the idea and the budget just so happened to be small, either way, it's the simplicity and subtlety that proves you can do a lot with a little, that with horror especially, less is more. The making of the movie is kind of an underdog story in a way, and it reminds me a bit of Steven Spielberg's Jaws. I mean, they both have a very simple score. You know, Jaws with the da -na, da -na, And equally da -na. as impactful. Exactly. And like how the Halloween theme is like the theme for the holiday itself. Jaws is a shark's theme song. Exactly. Every shark. It's the ocean's theme, yeah. really. Well, yeah. It's the ocean's theme. Both films also had a myriad of sequels that ruined the entire series, but clearly one series was butchered and stretched thin far worse than the other. Since Halloween, the original classic, was a hit, a sequel was inevitable. Next, Halloween 2. The first film ends with Loomis shooting Michael out of a second story window of a house, only for Loomis to look and see that Michael had vanished. Halloween 2 opens with that scene only to show that Michael had left a hilarious body shape imprint on the grass. The opening title sequence, which should be the first indication that the movie was not going to turn out quite as well as the first, the title sequence is like the original, slowly zooming in on an ominous jack o' lantern set to a haunting theme song. Only the jack o' lantern in this film looks derpy, and as the sequence ends, it opens up to reveal a skull. 
which is a bit goofy. What's even goofier, though, is the choice to revamp the classic timeless theme. A piano-driven song, I guess, wasn't good enough, so they reworked it to sound cooler and more with the times. Only the times was 1981, and redoing the theme that way instantly dates the theme song and completely lessens its impact. Another indication of the film's fleeting quality revealed in the opening titles, or just a quick Google search, is that John Carpenter did not return to direct this film. This film is directed by Rick Rosenthal. At the time, this was his directorial debut, and that can lead to a multitude of things. Sadly, the worst case scenario occurs with this one. After the complete misfire of an opening title sequence, the film follows Michael in another perspective shot, as he stalks and kills some girl in her home. Who is this girl? I don't know. What's supposed to be conveyed with that sequence, though, is that Michael is still out there, still killing, and completely unfazed by the six bullets shot into him by Dr. Loomis. Shortly after, Loomis is warning the police that even though he shot him six times, he's still alive. No one really takes him seriously or believes him, but Loomis's reasoning for Michael's survival was that he is no man. So in other words, the fact that Michael is simply and purely evil makes him invincible. An idea that I feel like is just too stupid. And the complete opposite effect of what they were probably going for by making him sort of invincible, the opposite effect happened because making him invincible does not add to the tension. It, it completely lessens it. And like I said, it just it makes it stupid. It does. It really does. One idea that this film presents, however, that I do find interesting is the paranoia and fear that Michael still being at large bestows upon the Haddonfield citizens. Lori is rushed to the hospital where she learns who it was that killed her friends and attempted to kill her. And I, I genuinely didn't realize at first that Lori had no idea that it was Michael Myers, whom she does know of because he's infamous in the town's history for the murder of his of his sister that, you know, we saw in the previous film. It's just it just never occurred to me that she never figured out that's Michael Myers. And in this film, she does. Unknown to the audience as to why, but Michael is hell-bent on finding and killing Lori. For the majority of the film, we believe he just wants to kill her simply because she's the one that got away. And the hospital that Lori is rushed to, which is a bland location, it's the setting for the rest of the film. Not the best or scariest or most effective location for a slasher film, but given the context, I guess it does make sense that the direct follow-up would take place in a hospital. I mean... Where else would someone go if they had been sliced in the arm with a knife? From the 35 minute mark to the hour nine minute mark, it's either the police on an endless and boring manhunt for Michael and a bunch of horror cliches that the first film did not feature, which makes this one feel like yet another trashy, disposable slasher film. These cliches include false jump scares, ear piercing sound effects and all, and some pointless nudity. Sure, the first film did include nudity, but in both scenes, the nudity is pretty obscured and not really the focus of the shot. In Halloween 2, however, the, I mean, one scene of nudity, though, it's really awkward, and it's kind of entirely the point of the shot. Like, the camera punches in on it. Among the many issues of this film, the absolute biggest one is that it is just so boring. So boring. So boring. Lori is sedated in the hospital for basically the entire second act, an hour and nine minutes in is when Michael finally catches Lori and anything somewhat interesting happens. Then finally, the most interesting and only real impactful aspect of this movie is at the one hour and 14 minute mark, it is revealed to Dr. Loomis that Lori Strode is Michael Myers' sister. Loomis figured out at that moment what Michael's true intention was. He killed one sister and now he's after his other. Another great aspect of the first film that was completely tarnished in this one was the design of Michael Myers, which is oddly a common recurrence for the majority of the films in this series. However, there is a reasonable purpose. While filming the first film, Nick Castle, who played Michael in the first film, would place the mask in his back pocket in between takes, rubbing off the paint on the mask because it was a William Shatner mask spray painted white. And the three years between this film and the last, the mask was kept under a chain-smoking crew member's bed, left to collect dust and turn yellow due to the cigarettes. That's why the mask looks a little off in this one, as well as the fact that they got a new actor to play Michael, and a much he was a much stockier guy, and that makes his mask like look more stretched out and a little wider. And it's not just terrible, but it is distracting. 
Yeah, it just it also doesn't make it scary, and you're like, oh, this weird guy in a strange, this weird, bulky, not scary guy. looking mask is coming after me. Ooh. The final scene, which should have been impactful, is ruined by some unintentional comedy. Michael corners Laurie and Loomis into a room where Laurie shoots Michael's eyes out, blinding him, as what happened when you get your eyes shot out. Mm. Except, I mean, shouldn't you die if your eyes get shot? I feel like you should shot? die, but it's Michael Myers. He doesn't die he whatsoever. No He's not man. He's evil. evil. The unintentional hilarity comes from the fact that Michael walks around blindly and repeatedly swinging his knife around with a hilarious whooshing sound effect. Whoosh. <laughs> Somehow more cartoony than that sound. Exactly. That you're making. Like even more so. Yeah. Uh, while Michael is performing the same move several times like a video game boss with a glitch, Loomis releases a flammable gas into the room. Then he gives Laurie a way out and ignites a lighter, sacrificing himself to burn Michael, killing him once and for all. The original idea for the Halloween series was to be an anthology. Each movie would be a different standalone horror story loosely connected by the holiday of Halloween. However, because of the success of the first film, they wanted the sequel to be a direct follow up to, you know, Michael Myers story and give it a conclusive ending. That is where the story of Michael Myers was supposed to end. We learned just why Michael was hunting Laurie specifically and Loomis sacrifices himself to kill Michael. With Michael's story now concluded, it was time to give the anthology idea a go. And that is what we got with Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, released the next year in October 1982. It may seem like this one would be one of the more interesting entries in this series. Like, its existence, I will admit, is pretty interesting. Like, the, the movie itself, though, there's not much to say about it because not much of anything happens. And not much of it is good at all. No. And after having Myers and Loomis killed off in the previous film, John Carpenter getting to produce Season of the Witch, yeah, that put him back on track for his original idea. This film follows a character named Daniel Chalice, played by Tom Atkins, who may be the epitome of a bad male protagonist. Like, it, he was disgusting. Yeah. And not not a likable character whatsoever. No, and, and it's been about four years since I watched the whole series for the first time. Yeah. And I swear, I mean, I'm glad that we rewatched them all because up until our recent revisit, I swear I thought his character was a detective. Because, like, <laughs> the plot, it follows him investigating this this toy company that's, like, manufacturing this new popular line of, like, kids' Halloween masks. However, he's a doctor. Anyways, that's not what makes him an awful protagonist. What makes him awful is that the performance from Tom Atkins is very wooden and very soulless, but the character is just a, a real piece of garbage. I mean, uh, early on in the film, we're shown that he has a wife and, and two young kids, and throughout his investigation, he seems to fall in love with his female co-star, and he also constantly flirts and treats his female co-workers, he, he treats them so inappropriately. Inappropriately for the workplace. And and that's all there is to his character. He's a soulless, creepy shell that only sees women as objects and I guess just doesn't love his wife all that much. And the actual story, though, is this nefarious toy company called Silver Shamrock. As they make a new line of kids' Halloween masks that are selling extremely well, and throughout the film, we're shown this commercial that plays a song counting down to the days until Halloween. And I must say, that is one of the most infuriating sounds I have ever heard in my entire life. That song is played 14 different times in the movie. It's worse than normal commercials, honestly. And it feels endless, like every time it plays. And I mean, one could argue that the repetition of the song and its infuriating sound was intentional, and maybe it's not supposed to be scary, but it's supposed to really make the audience uncomfortable in some way. And while I would say that's it's pretty obvious, it, it just doesn't mean it was a very good idea or that it was all that well executed. Nope, it was not. So why exactly is Silver Shamrock counting down the days until Halloween? Well, because they will be airing a feature presentation of Halloween, as in the original film. 
So they're basically implying that the film exists within the movie. An approach that is pretty ahead of its time, but... After airing the film, Silver Shamrock planned to announce a big giveaway and asked for all the kids to have their masks on for the big Halloween reveal. However, they were just going to play a migraine-inducing thing on the TV that would melt anyone who's watching with a mask on into a pile of bugs and snakes. Which I might add, does make me uncomfortable. And I don't want to give the movie credit because I just have, I have an inherited fear of snakes. And they're like my number one. Like snakes, I I know, and yeah. I instantly get uncomfortable. It instantly makes my skin crawl. You don't like eating at all after seeing a snake. No, like I just I lose all sense of joy. Joy, I do. <laughs> and seeing uh, like a big snake crawling out of the remains of a head in a Halloween mask in a pile of bugs, like no, no. But I don't want to give the movie credit for that because that's my fault. It for also being makes of snakes zero sense. No sense. We do find out why, though, or or kind of how. So we're shown that the masks have a built-in microchip that causes, you know, the heads to melt whenever you're wearing it. And it's made out of pieces of Stonehenge, for whatever reason, that the mustache-twirling villain stole. The finale, though, is easily the only interesting or even somewhat entertaining part of the movie. Chalice takes a box full of the microchips, dumps them all into the control room, and plays the migraine-inducing program that activates the chips, killing all the villains at once. Then it ends on an ambiguous note, with Chalice frantically trying to cancel the program. But the film ends before we see what might or might not have happened. At that point in time, audiences had already come to expect a Michael Myers story with a Halloween film, and quite possibly audiences just weren't ready for an anthology series that does get a little meta. And I mean, to be fair, going with an anthology approach for the third film, like that, I don't know, that that's just kind of asking for audiences to not really enjoy it or be interested in it. Yeah, if they started that with the second one, it might have been different, but Which was because the original idea. they didn't, it kind of backfired on them. That's the reason the film underperformed at the box office. On a budget of $2.5 million, it made back $6.3 million on opening weekend with a worldwide gross of $14 million, making it still, to this day, the lowest grossing film in the franchise. And I wouldn't say it's entirely the audience's like confusion about the approach that is why I think it ultimately failed, because it's not like this was a hidden gem that people just weren't ready for, because that does happen a lot. This was this is not one of them. The movie itself, it's, just not, it's, not good. it's not good. It is incredibly dull, somehow cheesier and campier than the first two, and has an unlikable and soulless lead and a plot that is just kind of pointless and dumb and boring. An anthology Halloween series could be a very cool idea. It's just that the execution wasn't there. The film has sort of developed a cult following, but really only because it's different and a lot of people admire that. I do respect that they decided to tr to take a risk and try something different, try a new approach, but they should have made a good movie. Many years after the release of this film and the series as a whole kind of being in limbo, John Carpenter sold the rights to the series because he had no interest in bringing Michael Myers back. Six years after the dud that was Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, the series returned with Halloween 4, appropriately titled... The Return of Michael Myers. This film might actually be where the continuity at face value can start to get a little confusing. It's called Halloween 4, but chronologically it's the third. It's set 10 years after the first two, which are both set on Halloween night in 1978. I'd say that maybe they should have dropped the numbers after Halloween 2. Just call the third one Halloween, Season of the Witch, and this one simply Halloween the return of Michael Myers. This film is set 10 years after the first two and provides not much explanation as to how Loomis and Michael survived the explosion. Loomis has a burn on his face and walks around with a cane, and Michael has his face all bandaged up before he dons the iconic William Shatner mask. Sort of. Although in Halloween 2, Michael's mask understandably looked different, in this film they completely redesigned his mask and it just looked stupid. He has eyebrows in this film. And it looks like Michael is in a constant state of a mild surprise. Like like he was just told something that 
isn't really that big of a deal that just kind of makes you go, oh, okay. Sadly, Jamie Lee Curtis did not return for this film. So this one follows her character's daughter who's with her adopted family because in the 10 years between this one and the first two, Lori and I guess her husband too, died. The daughter of Lori, cleverly named Jamie, which is kind of confusing to me, has reoccurring nightmares of Michael's return. On October 30th, Michael is transferred by ambulance and makes his escape and begins his hunt for his niece and her adopted sister, Rachel, played by Ellie Cornell, who's basically the new Lori. Even though her character is like Lori, just with little less step, she's a likable character and Cornell's performance is serviceable and the sister dynamic between her and Daniel Harris's Jamie is honestly pretty good and certainly one of the better aspects of this film. Rachel eventually takes Jamie trick-or-treating after being reluctant at first, but alas, Rachel loses her. Soon after, though, they find each other and join Dr. Loomis and Haddonfield Sheriff. Eventually, a large group of rednecks, one of whom had lost his son to Michael in the previous films, decided to band together and try to hunt and kill him. They soon corner someone in the dark, believing it to be Michael, and they seem to unload every single bullet onto him, only to find out that it was some guy named Ted. Just like Halloween 2, this plays with the idea that what the fear of Michael bestows upon the town's citizens, only this time it sort of is in a horde mentality approach. The finale of this fairly short and pretty well-paced movie is a chase that goes from a three-story house to a school where Michael is suddenly and distractingly blonde for a few frames and then a car chase. As stupid as some moments may be, I don't think this finale is all that bad. However, other than Michael Myers' presence, what exactly does this film have in common with the original? Not much. However, the focus of this film wasn't entirely on the graphic kills or the nudity. After a car chase, Michael is thrown into a ditch on the side of a road and they're countered by the police as they all gun Michael down. At this point, we're left to assume that Michael is now dead once and for all even going as far as to have Loomis say, Michael is in hell now. The final scene ends on a very interesting, if not really stupid note. The closing scene is in a first person shot from Jamie's perspective, almost recreating the opening to the original film, attacking her adopted mom with a pair of scissors, showing that Michael's evil runs in the family and passing the evil torch to Jamie. Then the film abruptly ends. Not everyone likes this film, and although I don't think it's all that bad, it is a far cry from the original, and what completely made it good, or even what made it what it was. Of the aspects I actually enjoy from this entry would be the leads. I feel like Rachel and Jamie have good chemistry, and they're not the most fleshed out characters, but they're likable enough. I also really like that it went back to the original score. Sure, it is reworked a little bit, but not in an awful, instantly dated way like the second one, and it was refreshing to hear that original theme after the god-awful music from Halloween 3. However, the cinematography is bland as all can be. It, I mean, it honestly looks like a Lifetime movie. And the dialogue is poorly written, especially in the exposition. I mean, the writing as a whole is pretty bad. Not much characterization occurs, so when a character is killed by Myers, not much of anything is felt. And as I said earlier, or as you said earlier, Michael's redesign, it's horrible. And and the mask, it, it looked hilarious. The random blonde shots too. Like I know that when they were developing the movie, originally they had considered making Michael blonde, but they decided in the end to keep his hair brown like in the original. But the fact that there's still like two frames that include the blonde hair that's just that's such an amateur mistake and towards the end of the film whenever he's thrown off the cars it looks like he's gone on like hockey pads underneath his coveralls which i get for the actor's safety it just it shouldn't have been shown at no, all like in the shot of him mm -mm. standing up maybe remove the hockey pads at that point if that's what it was the padding it's it's padding but like like, just remove that, because in that one shot, he looks so stocky and, and mildly surprised. Yeah. <laughs> he, he just, he doesn't look intimidating or scary in the slightest. He just looks kind of goofy. And stupid. With this film, the series starts to become less and less what made the original so good and so impactful, and the series starts to go beyond recognition. Not quite yet with this one kind of just the beginning stages of crossing that line that John Carpenter drew for them to never cross. However, this film was a hit, and of course, we 
we're given Halloween 5, The Revenge of Michael Myers. This film was released almost exactly a year after the previous film on October 13th, 1989. After an unintentionally hilarious opening title sequence set to a series of choppily edited close-up shots of someone like chopping and carving into a pumpkin. Much like Halloween 2, this film's opening scene is the closing of the previous film, showing Michael being gunned down only we see just what happened to him. He did not die because... Yeah, because remember, he's not a man, and evil is invincible. Instead, we're shown that Michael fell into a mine shaft, and he begins to crawl out into a nearby river. He washes up to be picked up by an older gentleman, and he takes Michael in, lays him down to tend to him. Before we see Michael start to wake up with a close-up shot of a symbol on his wrist, a symbol that we will learn more about later. Then as Michael kills the man that took him in, we see Jamie, now at a child's mental institution, set on October 30th, 1989, feeling every jab that Michael puts into the man, showing that Jamie hasn't necessarily been past Michael's evil torch, but that the two are connected, so much so that Jamie is now mute. Soon after, within the 20 minute mark, Rachel is killed in her own home by Michael. That's right, the main character of the last film, is unceremoniously killed off within the first act, which... Oh. It's not the... It is the first time that happens. But it won't be the last. Then the rest of the movie plays out, and it's... It's bad. One thing I can say that the fourth film did not suffer from that two and three did was that it wasn't... It wasn't really boring. The fourth one was only an hour and 28 minutes, so it gets to the point fast and doesn't really waste any time much like the original. After the infuriating opening, the film grinds to a halt. I mean, dead. And a lot of nothing at all happens, and the movie just drones on. In fact, I mean, before re-watching it, in the four years since watching it the first time, I completely forgot the significance of this one or anything that happened. Like, I, my memory was blank on this one. And I mean, w would you say this is a... That Halloween 5, The Revenge of Michael Myers, is a fairly forgettable film. It's very forgettable. Really, I I only remember Jamie being in the hospital for a little bit and her being mute and her being kind of connected to Michael Myers. And that's pretty much the only thing I remember from that film. Yeah. And it just kind of meshes with the rest of them. Yeah, like after the after you watch it once... I mean, it's only been like four days since we watched it. Yeah. And already it just, it really feels like they've meshed in, in our heads as one movie. Along with the glimpse of the symbol on Michael's wrist, the film also shows a mysterious man dressed in all black and steel-toed boots for whatever, whatever reason, just wandering around the movie. We learn nothing of this man. Not yet. And like I said, it's only been about four days since we last watched this movie. And if I remember right, the film ends with Michael being locked in a holding cell and then an explosion goes off. And Jamie finds his cell empty and that makes her scared. And the film abruptly ends. The pattern, I'd say, is starting to become a little more visible here. Halloween 4 was a far cry from what the original was. But Halloween 5 is now merely a fraction of what the series once was with the first film. The film ends abruptly, so I guess you can call it a cliffhanger, and leaves a few mysterious plot threads wide open, such as the symbol on Michael's hand and the mysterious man in black. What do either of those mean? Does anyone actually care? I don't know. You know, you're going to figure it out anyway. It doesn't matter. Halloween, the curse of Michael Myers. I'm not going to waste anyone's time at the start of this one here. This film is insufferable, and it is a complete mess. <laughs> This movie had production issues after production issues. I I'm aware there's a producer's cut that is eight minutes longer, but I just can't imagine that only eight minutes completely saves this movie from its terrible editing, terrible writing, terrible acting, and it's just it's all around terribleness. Or as the actors and crew describe the film itself during production, it's ridiculousness. Apparently, there was a test screening for the film that consisted mainly of teenagers, and none of them liked the original ending of the film, which would have been a cult ritual passing the Curse of Thorn, which we'll get into what that is, onto Dr. Loomis. 
only they couldn't completely reshoot a new ending because Donald Pleasance had tragically passed away in February of 1995. And this film was released in September of 1995 for some reason. I mean, it was September 29th, so it was closer to October than September, but still just a really stupid release date. Even though Donald Pleasance had sadly passed away, they reshot a new ending anyways and removed about 20 minutes of footage. So the producer's cut doesn't really fully restore the movie, now does it? No. So what is it about this one that is such a mess? Now, remember how the first one's explanation for Michael's psyche was just Dr. Loomis saying he realized what was living behind that boy's eyes was purely and simply evil. Re remember how it was left at that because in horror, you know, less is more and being ambiguous is much more haunting. Well, considering this is the sixth film in the franchise, the fifth to be about Michael Myers, the series had been stretched hilariously thin and they finally crossed that line that John Carpenter drew for them not to cross all the way back in the first film. We learn about the mysterious man in black from the previous film and what the symbol on Michael's hand means. An older Tommy Doyle, who Lori babysat in the first film, this time played by a fresh-faced Paul Rudd of all people. He had spent all the years since he had first encountered Michael Myers on Halloween night, 1978, researching Michael and his origin. He explains that the symbol on Michael's hand comes from stone carvings that acted as an early alphabet and stems back to 500 BC and are also used in pagan rituals to predate future events and invoke magic. I I'm not kidding. These are, I'm directly quoting the film. So Tommy explains among the ancient druids, Thorn, the symbol seen on Michael's hand, represents a demon that spreads sickness, bringing death to hundreds of thousands of people. According to Celtic legend, one child from each tribe was chosen to be infected with the curse of Thorn to offer the blood sacrifices of its next of kin on the night of Samain. Samain. Salmon. Which is Halloween. The sacrifice of one family meant sparing the lives of an entire tribe. Tommy further explains, For years I've been convinced there must be some reason, some method behind Michael's madness. But wait, there's more. Tommy proceeds to explain, The druids were also great mathematicians and astronomers, but the thorn symbol is actually a constellation of stars that appear from time to time on Halloween night. Whenever it appears, he appears. Coincidence? I think that's why these people, whoever they are, are after Jamie's baby. To make him Michael's final sacrifice. Yeah, yeah, okay. The opening scene, it shows an aged, young adult version of Jamie having a baby in like a weird cult chamber. It's a very poorly edited scene that's supposed to be ambiguous until it's hilariously delivered exposition dump from Paul Rudd. Which, let's just, let's talk about Paul Rudd for a second here. We love Paul Rudd. Love Paul love Paul Rudd. He seems like a genuinely great guy. Like He's the everyone... sexiest man of the year. And... Oh my god, he actually was. Was it this year or was it last year? I have no idea. I can't remember now. I feel like it might be this year. It was recent though. Yeah. He's great. We love him. But he is awful in this film. Awful. Which I, I want to give him a pass because this although not technically his film debut since Clueless came out July of 1995, this was shot before Clueless. So this was his first time acting acting yeah. on screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and he just maybe hadn't quite found his theme yeah. yet. His first experience, first director, first person telling him what to do on a set. Like, yeah. Yeah. And, and, I mean, he de he delivers his line. The way he delivers his lines reminds me of Jack Black. Like he's like the ancient druids have these symbols, and the thorn symbol is a constellation yeah. of stars that appear on Halloween. He really drew out the ends of his words. He did, and and like I said, he just probably quite hadn't quite found his thing yet yeah. that we all know him for today. And and he, I don't think he's been in a horror film since. No. And I don't blame him. Which is fine. With Clueless, you know, I haven't seen Clueless, but I can imagine that being a comedy, he was much more in his area of expertise. I agree. I agree. And I, Clueless is just the timeless 
90s drama that it is, I wouldn't say he was the best in it, but I would say that it's definitely a step up. Anyways, it's fair to say that the line between subtly haunting and too much and too stupid that John Carpenter drew for the series in the first film was not just crossed by this film. Halloween 2 just kind of moved closer to that line. Halloween 3 just it, just, it just did whatever it wanted. Halloween 4 lightly stepped over the line. Halloween 5 is too forgettable to make any sort of impact at all, but still, over the line. The curse of Michael Myers, though, just jumps right over it and never stops and throws any and all subtlety right out the window. But wait, there's still more. So uh, that mysterious man in black that just wandered around in the last movie, yeah, he's part of the cult of Thorn. And he is the one who tells their next subject to kill their family. In other words, it was this guy who told Michael to kill his sister all the way back in the first film. With the first film, any slight thought the audience could have had about the reason for Michael's madness is likely scarier than whatever they put to screen. Unfortunately, we know for a fact that whatever anyone could have interpreted is much better than the answers that are forced in some terribly written expository dialogue. Other issues with this movie, the editing. This movie is infamous for its terrible editing. The editing is so bad, Awful. scenes just ad- abruptly end. They just end and then another scene starts yeah, without like, any transition there's like whatsoever. There's fades and cuts to black, like that is the biggest telltale sign yeah. that the movie was unfinished. Yeah, the entire flow and structure of the movie basically is non-existent. And it's no surprise that 20 plus minutes from the film are missing because it genuinely feels unfinished. Yeah, like, like I don't know, it's just, it doesn't seem like a complete movie. Yeah. Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers was so bad and drove the series far past recognition so much that three years later, the series was softly rebooted. And now we turn to Halloween H2O 20 years later. Let's start off with this one by addressing the elephant in the room here. The title. That title is absolutely terrible. Atrocious. Genuinely one of the worst movie titles of all time. I mean, Way too long. What's wrong with just calling the film Halloween 20 years later? Like, why does it need an abbreviation in the middle? And it's also the chemical symbol for water? Like... Why? Halloween H2O is the first genuine soft reboot in the series. 4, 5, and 6 just stretched the series so far past the point of recognition and so far past the point of no return that if anyone had even thought about making more Halloween Michael Myers movies, then a reboot of some kind would very much be needed. This film doesn't entirely start from scratch, though. It was released on August 5th, 1998, almost 20 years from the original movie. Had they not stupidly released it in August. I mean, I just I just think that's stupid. Like it's called Halloween. Like why is it released in any month that isn't October? Like and why has it happened twice now? Halloween H2O only ties into the first two films in the series. So for this continuity, it goes Halloween, Halloween 2, and Halloween H2O 20 years later. Lori is not dead. She doesn't have a daughter. Michael Myers is not cursed by some Halloween cult. Everything we just talked about between two and right now doesn't matter in terms of this film's continuity. When rewatching and marathoning the series, this one felt like it, it always feels like a small breath of fresh air. Small breath because this still is not a very good movie, but fresh air nonetheless because all the stupidity the last three movies it, it, they, it no longer matters. And the biggest bit of fresh air this movie offers is the highly awaited return of Jamie Lee Curtis. Jamie Lee decided to return and make this film as a sort of thank you to the fans of, of the series. And as the original film, you know, it, it kickstarted her now legendary career. And props to her for doing that. Because, like, at that point, 1998. Halloween needed her more than she needed Halloween. The film opens with the nurse that we saw in the original film, the one that was like working with Loomis that was driving him to the hospital when Michael made his escape. Yeah, her. 
It opens with her returning home after work, but before she goes into her home, she just has this strange feeling. And she asks these two neighborhood boys, one of them played by a young Joseph Gordon-Levitt, which is pretty cool, and she asks them to examine her house to see if anyone had broken in. Levitt's character reluctantly goes in to find nothing, except for some beers in the fridge that he takes. The nurse goes into her home only to find her office had been raided and that all the files on Laurie Strode had been taken. At this point, she knew that Michael had returned. She calls the police and rushes to JGL, that's Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character's house next door, to check on them, only to find the gruesome aftermath of a Michael Myers attack. The police arrive at the nurse's home, only for her to be killed by Myers in the house next door. The opening scene, I feel, perfectly demonstrates the good things about this movie and the bad things. Good things, the suspense and fear are fairly well captured, but the design of Michael Myers is absolutely disgraceful. Probably the worst mask in the entire series. Everything about it is just off. On top of that, he himself looks like a young boy dressed as Michael Myers for Halloween. The opening title sequence showcases a wall of newspaper clippings and audio from the original film of Dr. Loomis saying the purely and simply evil line. A portion that, viewing it now, seems extremely expository. However, given the time of its release, audiences maybe needed the reminder that this film only ties into the first... <clears throat> A portion that, viewing it now, seems extremely expository. However, given the time of its release, audiences likely needed the reminder that this film only ties into the first two, and Michael is not cursed by some stupid cult. Thank God they just kept Michael as being simply and purely evil. And keeping it simple, like the original, less is more. After the opening titles were shown that Lori had moved to some town in California and goes by a different name, Carrie Tate. She teaches at a private school where her 17-year-old son, John, played by a then 20-year-old fresh-faced Josh Hartnett, also attends. Lori is shown to be a very overprotective parent for obvious reasons that really don't need to be said. However, her overprotectiveness is shown early on in the film to drive a wedge between her and her son. He wants to go on a tr school trip to Yosemite, but she forbids him from that. Towards the second act of the film, the student body leaves for their Yosemite trip, leaving Lori, the guidance counselor of the school, Will Brennan, who Lori is also in a relationship with, and LL Cool J's character. With the school being empty on Halloween night, John and his girlfriend Molly, played by Michelle Williams, and two of their friends decide to have their own Halloween party in the school's basement. Only Michael Myers found them. When one of John's friends first encounters Michael as the finale nears, his mask is completely CGI. And since it was 1998, it wasn't very good CGI. And don't ask us why. So Michael kills John's two friends, but not his girlfriend. And Lori rushes to the school to save her son. Will goes with her. He accidentally shoots LL Cool J. And I guess it's because he thinks... He's He's Michael Myers. He thought it was Mike. He, he just saw him as a shadow. Saw him, yeah. Michael kills Will, and then a chase ensues between Lori and Michael through the prep school. The chase ends with Lori stabbing Michael several times before pushing him off a balcony. Lori, now standing above Michael's body, thrusts her arm back to kill Michael once and for all. Until LL Cool J, who actually survived somehow, stops Lori as the authorities arrive. As the tension begins to die down, easily the best part of the film starts as Lori sees Michael's body being put into an ambulance. Lori holds a gun to the paramedic to put Michael in the ambulance, forces him to close the doors, and she steals it and drives away. As she drives on a desolate mountainside road, Michael wakes up and attacks her right there until she slams on the brakes, sending Michael flying through the windshield. Michael stands up, and Lori runs him over, only for him to go rolling down the side of a hill. Lori falls out of the ambulance and lands, not safely, but not fatally, and Michael is pinned from the waist down between the ambulance and a tree. Lori gets up and approaches a struggling Michael. The best part of the movie. Once Lori and Michael make eye contact, Michael calms down and reaches his hand out to her, almost in his own way, begging for mercy. Lori internally decides not to give Michael the remorse that he never gave. And with one swing of an axe, Lori decapitates Michael. And the iconic theme song kicks in, and the film ends. Then a Creed song plays in the credits. That's Halloween H2O 20 years later. What was supposed to be the conclusion of the series, The Death of Michael Myers, once and for all. 
and the closure of Laurie Strode. It's a mostly uneventful film. Michael Myers' design is hilariously ugly, and many elements of the story are just kind of boring and just kind of nothing. However, a very long-awaited and highly welcome return of Jamie Lee Curtis and a very strong finale makes this a more-than-worthy conclusion to a series that had long been stretched way too thin and was long overdue for a finale, for an ending, for a conclusion. And it, this film gave the this, this series a chance to end on a much higher note than what the previous films had been on and end in a completely, and for it to not end in a completely unrecognizable state. Only this film was a hit, so. Halloween Resurrection, released on July 12th, 2002. Now, I know not everyone looks into release dates this much, but I feel like this just shows how far the series has strayed from the original. This is the third film in a row to not even be released in October. This film is the furthest from Halloween release date in the entire series. Just... Let's start off on this one by addressing the elephant in the room. Yet again, this title is also awful and also one of the worst titles of all time. This film is part of the reason why movies with resurrection in the title are known to suck. That's there's there's Alien Resurrection, there's this film, there's also Birdemic 2, The Resurrection, Mechanic Resurrection. Here recently, there was The Matrix Resurrection. It's one of those lazy, single, long R titles, like Resident Evil Retribution or something. Those subtitles aren't as cool or as smart as they likely think they are, and all the movies that I just mentioned just now, they're terrible. Halloween Resurrection is terrible. Because H2O was such a hit, they couldn't leave well enough alone and decided to continue off of the ending and continuity of that film. The film's opening scene is pretty much unanimously hated. I can't say I've met a single person or heard of a single person say anything good about this opening. Not even pretentious film bros who will defend anything because it's different have defended this opening scene. The opening to this film is completely unsafe from everyone. The film starts in a mental institution, which doesn't seem all that strange at first until you start to wonder who's being kept there. The scene plays out with two nurses taking pills to a mysterious inmate. Through some hilarious written expositional dialogue, we're told and shown that in the last film, when the first cop found Michael before Lori killed him, Michael woke up, attacked the cop, crushed his larynx, preventing him from speaking, and switch places with him. Therefore, the Michael that woke up in the back of an ambulance and attacked Lori and flew through the windshield only to be run over and pinned into a tree and reached out to Lori for mercy only for her to decapitate him? Yeah, that was an innocent cop. Lori's the one being held at the mental institution because according to this film, the great and satisfying final scene of H2O was actually Lori beheading a cop without remorse. It gets worse though. We're shown that Lori has been storing her pills in a little stuffed toy so she was not sedated or anything. And she was completely herself and waiting for the day Michael returns to kill her. Which is the night that the opening takes place. Michael's design in H2O was horrible, but my gosh, they somehow made it worse in this one. It's basically the same mask as the last film, only it has very obvious makeup applied to the facial muscles. I guess to have the facial features pop out more on screen, only it just looks really unappealing. Once Michael arrives at the institution, some crap happens and somehow Laurie ends up dangling him over the edge of the institution's roof and just like in the last film, he doesn't struggle but reaches out for mercy. Since the last time this happened, Laurie ended up killing some innocent cop, so she tells herself out loud just to make sure. And she reaches over to Michael to take off his mask, only she did exactly what he wanted her to do. And he grabs her arm and throws her off the roof. And she dies. They had the audacity to kill Lori in the most insulting way to her character possible. But they also have her in the forefront of the movie's poster. However, this is not the first slasher film to include a hugely famous actor that dies in the opening on the poster. More on that later. The plot of this film centers around a sort of paranormal investigation show, a little bit like Ghost Hunters. The host of this show is played by Buster Rhymes, who is definitely a reason this film is terrible. And the co-host of the show is played by Tyra Banks. 
who is also terrible. The two of them travel to Haddonfield for a Halloween special and cast six dull and unlikable college students to put on some GoPros and creep around the old, rundown Myers residence. The film, with this reality TV show aspect, tries to be a little meta, and it addresses how people, you know, they love a violent spectacle, even if it's clearly fabricated, but sold as reality. Also, there are several moments where we directly see the perspective of the students' GoPros. This movie really tried to be like Scream and the Blair Witch Project all at once. Only by doing a Scream angle six years after the original Scream film was released, just made it seem like it was jumping on a trend that was already past its prime considering Scream 2 and 3 had already been out for a few years at that point. And Blair Witch was also a few years old and it ended up inventing the found footage genre, which is already a dead genre. Thankfully though, the film isn't fully that. It's just Blair Witch took place in a vast forest. It's easy to get lost in, and you don't know what could be lurking. The Myers home is an old abandoned two-story house. Sending in six different people with cameras would result in a couple of minutes of just looking at old rooms, and that would be it. It's not like the Myers home is some huge old abandoned mansion in the middle of nowhere. It's just a two-story house in the middle of a neighborhood. It wouldn't be interesting. It's just it's just a house with history, sure, but like one killing. Yeah, yeah, and and sending in six people like that that I'd say covers the house. It's not like it was a ghost or anything. Yeah, and I mean there is a scene where Buster Rhymes dresses up as Michael, and like tries to you know add some flair to the show, but it just plays on that meta aspect, and it's it's poorly done. Yeah. Michael Myers is at the house, though. He kills some of the characters. The guy from Lucky the Irish, Ryan Merriman, he's in this, but only as someone who watches the broadcast. Yeah, he was a w- weirdly placed character. I don't fully understand He was, like, I, I guess he was communicating with one of the characters. I think he was actually catfishing her, because right. I'm, I'm thinking that, I mean, he obviously looked like he was, like, 15 or something, and she was, like, in college, you know? I think they were both in college. Well. <laughs> I have no idea. I don't know. It seemed like he was catfishing her. The movie ends with Buster Rhymes electrocuting Michael and then the house burning down. That's Halloween Resurrections, a film that is not enjoyed by a single person. The film holds an embarrassing score of 19 on Metacritic and an even more embarrassing 10% on Rotten Tomatoes. After a film that ended the series on a fairly correct track, they just had to immediately take it right back over the line to being completely unrecognizable from the original and ended up just completely insulting the the, the whole legacy of the character within the opening scene alone and and then ripping off Scream and Blair Witch for a Halloween movie. It just, it doesn't work. It is. And when a series starts that when a series that was once the trend setter starts to be the trend follower that's when you know that it's time for the series to finally end or that just means that they should start from scratch reboot the series a new cast a new approach a terrible director five years after halloween resurrection that is exactly what happened halloween it's just called Halloween. It's a it's a sort of remake. I'll start off this one by stating that I do not like Rob Zombie. I find his whole persona as just it's just unappealing. And if you're a fan of Rob Zombie, that is fine. That is okay. I just don't. I don't see it. I don't get it. And I. Yeah, yeah, he is. And I don't find his style of directing, if you can call it that. I just don't find his movies appealing. I don't enjoy them. This film was also released on August 31st, 2007. The interesting thing about this film is that it's not completely a remake, like I said, and it is much longer than the original because it's kind of a Michael Myers origin story, and that idea doesn't seem too bad at first. You know, the 15 years between Michael killing his sister and escaping from Smith's Grove, they're completely unknown. And all we know about those 15 years is that eight of them were spent with Loomis trying to, like, understand and reach Michael. And then the next seven, he was trying to keep him locked up. And we don't know why entirely. We don't know if there was an incident. And that's fine. That's better. Less is more. 
Now, where this film goes wrong with the depiction of Michael Myers isn't necessarily what happens. It's the fact that we're spoon-fed every detail with zero room for interpretation. On top of that, it's in Rob Zombie's unappealing, trashy, and incompetent style. The film begins taking place on the morning of October 31st in an unspecified year. We're shown that this film's Michael Myers lives in an abusive white trash family with an overworked and poorly treated mother. Deborah Myers, played by Sherry Moon Zombie, Rob Zombie's wife. He just has to put his own wife in the movie. She is in all of his movies, as far as I'm aware. For some reason. He loves his wife. (laughs) There is also an older teenage sister, Judith Myers, who's portrayed in an objectifying way. And when she's not objectified, she's just portrayed as being a horribly unlikable and just nasty person. The worst, however, is Michael's stepdad or Deborah's boyfriend. We We don't really know. We know it's not his dad. Yeah. He's just loud and very verbally abusive constantly calling Deborah a bitch and whore and even makes filthy comments about Judith's body and then tells Deborah that her teenage daughter has a nicer ass than her. We're also shown that Michael has a baby sister whom he loves and shows some affection towards. What we see of the 10-year-old Michael played by Dag Farch is that he loves wearing masks and killing animals as we see him washing blood off his hands and telling his mom that his rut had just died. From the get-go, it's made extremely clear that Michael was deranged from the start. So why hone in and focus so much on his family being so horrible, trashy people? Just to make the movies harder to watch? I I guess. I guess. Uh, It seems pointless since we already are shown that he's deranged from the start. Yeah, I guess they were just trying to add they're trying to add more factors in to make it more textbook and disturbing. Like, I guess. In a scene soon after, Michael is shown in the school bathroom as he leaves. The school bully, played by Daryl Sabara, um, so he walks in and starts a fight with Michael. The principal walks in and Michael says some swear words. And the principal calls Deborah to the school and introduces her to Dr. Sam Loomis. And um, he's played by uh, the legendary Malcolm McDowell. So if, if uh, there are any Clockwork Orange fans out there... This is your time to this shine. This is your Halloween movie. Yeah, this is your Halloween movie. So, Malcolm McDowell is the only redeeming aspect of this mm, one. Yeah, basically. Yeah, his portrayal of Loomis is very different than Donald Pleasance, but not entirely in a bad way. Malcolm McDowell is one of those actors who will play the part whichever way he wants, and it usually works. Or it's very interesting. Yeah. Like, if it doesn't necessarily work, it's at least interesting. Definitely. And Malcolm McDowell's portray is Malcolm McDowell's version of Loomis. Like, it's, like that it's is his, his own. own. Yeah, he doesn't... He doesn't try to replicate He doesn't try Donald to replicate presence. it, yeah. Michael waits outside the office while the principal, Loomis, and Deborah are discussing what to do with him. Then the original theme song abruptly kicks in, and Michael suddenly gets up and sneaks out of the school, following Daryl Sabara's character and killing him after he goes into an empty area. I think it's a very odd choice for the original song to first be played in this movie in this moment. Like, I get it. It's Michael's first kill in this version. But the theme song fades before anything actually happens. Yeah, it just, even it abruptly ends. It just kind of happens and then just goes away. And then Michael kills Daryl Sabara's character. I just feel like this demonstrates how little Rob Zombie truly understands just how to make a movie. It's now Halloween night. Michael's stepdad has a broken leg and arm from an incident that takes place before the film, and it was only discussed, but because of that, he can't take Michael trick-or-treating. Deborah can't either because she's working a late shift, so Judith has to take him only once Deborah leaves. Her boyfriend arrives, and they go upstairs for Michael to not go trick-or-treating at all. He sits outside, puts on his mask, and kills everyone in the house. It's not just his sister in a shot that's an obscure first-person perspective shot looking through a mask and handled in a tasteful way. Instead, he kills his stepdad, uh, Judith's boyfriend, and then Judith herself. And we see every gruesome second of it in elongated detail, not without some awful shaky cam because it's a 2000s movie that was... That was the way to do it. If it's not obvious at this point, this film goes headfirst into focusing on the brutal violence rather than a haunting atmosphere. 
Rob Zombie has shown time and time again, not just with this movie, but with really all of his movies, that he seems to think that graphic, unappealing, and tasteless violence equals good horror. Michael is then taken to Smith's Grove, where Dr. Loomis begins to try and understand and help Michael, only for him to progressively become more distant, and these scenes really shows that the young actor, even though he is just a kid, that plays young Michael is not very good. As Michael becomes more distant, he refuses to take off his mask and refuses to speak. One day, while Deborah visits Michael, Dr. Loomis takes her out into the hallway to speak to her in private while a nurse stays in the cafeteria with Michael, only for him to grab a fork, which I don't know why they would let him eat with a metal fork. At that point in time, they'd be smart to do that. But he takes the fork and stabs it into the nurse's body. I don't know. We didn't really, I, don't, I didn't catch where. Shockingly. Panic ensues, and Deborah pulls Michael's mask off, and he freaks out. We then see Deborah, now all alone with her baby daughter, watching an old home videotape of Michael, and then she takes her own life. Flash forward 15 years, and now the film is a direct remake of the original, just with a few changes that some are not that big of a deal, others are for the worst. The beginning of the film that focuses on young Michael makes up about 55 minutes of this 121 minute long film. And although, I know, and although nothing just hilariously stupid happens, the over explanation of Michael's backstory and leaving zero room for interpretation and focusing so heavily on the brutality and it taking up that much of the running time, it sets the pacing off so bad. Like the parts that focuses on young Michael you think that like maybe they were just going for a prologue but since it's so long it's like you think oh it's the first act and then the 15 year time jump that's the second act only it's still the first act because we still haven't been introduced to all the main characters yet or even the real central conflict this film's weird structure causes it to just drag this movie there is no structure, and the movie feels endless. Whereas literally, all the previous films, even the worst ones, they they don't ever breach the two-hour mark because a Halloween movie has no business being that long. So after the 15-year time jump, Michael is now played by professional wrestler Tyler Mayne, playing a six-foot-three absolute unit of a Michael Myers, which actually I think looks pretty funny in some shots. Like, they just can't, they can't get his size right or his look in any way after the original. Like, whenever he's played by an actor that's too short, he just, he looks like a young boy dressed as Michael Myers for Halloween. But whenever they cast a six foot three pro wrestler, it just reminds me of a giant cartoon character like Shrek or Gru. And uh, so Michael's escape scene, it's a lot different than the original. And the changes are not for the better. So two of the security guards, one of them working the night shift, go to a new young female patient's room to force her into actions that one should never be forced into, especially not a mentally unsound institution patient. Only one of the guards who got randomly upset at Michael in an earlier scene decides that they should perform these unspeakable acts in Michael's room for whatever reason with Michael in it. I don't know why. The scene goes on for a disturbingly long period of time, and a lot of explicit detail is visibly shown of these two guards doing unspeakable things to this helpless girl, while Michael just sits there, and he doesn't even act until one of the guards grabs one of Michael's masks off his wall, and then he kills both of them. Now, don't, don't think too highly of him killing these two creeps, because I'm pretty sure it's implied that he also kills the girl. Don't quote me on that but i'm pretty sure that's implied like he is still the villain but the problem though really is that scene didn't play out like that in the original because it didn't need to for this version rob zombie just added it because it was shocking and disgusting and disturbing it adds no real purpose to the film in the end and is once again too much focus on the brutality and just making this movie really insufferable it's just very trashy and just unneeded like we didn't need that scene at all like what was whatsoever. wrong with michael just escaping from the building and then stealing dr loomis's car what was yeah. wrong with that nothing. nothing that's why it was like that in the original after michael's escape 
were then introduced to scout Taylor Compton as this film's version of Laurie Strode. Boo! The writing of her character is not good, and Taylor Compton is not that good of an actress. Mm -mm. She she plays a very annoying Laurie, and I don't fully blame her. I think it's the writing. They made her really annoying. Yeah, they did. It's like they tried too hard to make her a relatable, funny girl. Which it's fine if she cracks jokes. It's just, it was so constant and not anything like Lori. And I mean, just with the way she's portrayed in this one alone, I would say is already an insult to the original Lori as a whole. However, it, uh, it gets worse. And it never gets better. Just within the Rob Zombie continuity, that is, though. A lot of the same stuff from the original happens just in slightly different ways and is directed a lot worse. The ending, though, really, really drags. In the original, when Loomis shoots Michael out of the house, Lori asks if that was a boogeyman. Loomis says, I believe it was. Notices Michael disappears. Movie ends. It's it's ambiguous. It's haunting. It's fine. In this version, though, Loomis shoots him and takes Lori to his car to drive her to safety. She asks if that was the boogeyman in an awkwardly delivered way that was kind of funny. And then Michael busts through the car window and drags Lori out. Then he chases her through the house for what feels like an eternity. They bust through the walls and, and the ceiling. And, and, and it's like a Wile E. Coyote and uh, Roadrunner sketch. Like, it is that level of cartoony. Then they end up back outside. And Lori shoots Michael in the face. And the camera zooms in to Lori screaming, bloodied face, as it fades to the home videotape shown earlier on in the movie. And then it abruptly, thankfully, ends. Already, in almost every single way, even with this one film, like starting from scratch, it's still just so, it just lacks every bit of understanding of the original film. And many people have and will defend this one because it is a different approach and Rob Zombie stuck with his style rather than just trying to replicate John Carpenter. And I do understand that, and I respect that to an extent. It's just Rob Zombie's style is so incompetent and unappealing. There's another one, though. Halloween 2. I've been really dreading this one. Like, when I first watched the series years ago, I honestly didn't finish this one. Because it just it, it just didn't feel like a Halloween movie. Some would agree that Halloween Resurrection is the worst one in the series. What I have to say about that, at least Michael Myers somewhat is still Michael Myers. They, they got him in the mask. They got him in the coveralls. He doesn't emote. And he, he doesn't speak. That, at the bare minimum, they had the bare minimum understanding of Michael Myers. Rob Zombie's Halloween 2 doesn't even get that right. From the get-go, Rob Zombie knew that if he did get to to make a sequel, it wasn't going to be a remake of Halloween 2 from 1981, and that he would want to go in his own direction with a sequel. Which is fine if that direction wasn't terrible. This film starts directly after the previous film, with Lori finding a cop and telling him that she killed Michael. As she's in a state of shock, they strap her down and rush her to the hospital. It feels like a lifetime until Michael shows up at the hospital to brutally mutilate the staff and hunt down Lori. One huge issue that may go unnoticed by most is that Michael aggressively grunts when he brutally destroys his victims in the two Rob Zombie films. Not that it's a big deal or anything, it's just one thing we actually hear from Michael is just his breathing. That's all we ever hear in the whole series. It's it's more chilling than the aggressive grunts that make no sense. Yeah. And it it just adds a lack of understanding from Rob Zombie to the character and like even more lack of an understanding. The general unappealing nature to this film and the rest of his films too. It's just very unappealing. And after a very long, boring, repetitive, difficult to watch chase scene throughout the hospital, it ends with Michael just about to kill Lori until she wakes up. And the entire elongated and horribly paced opening sequence was all a dream. So this film contains a lot of very pretentious dream sequences that involves present day Michael, 10 year old Michael, now played by Chase Wright Vanek, and some weird angel version of Deborah Myers, played by 
again, Rob Zombie's wife. A lot of these trippy sequences rely a lot on visual storytelling, obviously, but it all comes across as something you'd see in a freeform show. It's all very pretentious and no Halloween movie has any business trying to be some art house elevated horror film, especially if it's made as incompetently as this one or if it really has nothing to say at all. Now, where exactly does this film go wrong with the portrayal and depictions? Well, first off, Lori becomes a just filthy train wreck in this film. Understandable, sure, as this version of Lori went through a lot more traumatizing events than the original because the brutality, you know, it's all Mr. Robert Zombie focuses on. The type of trauma this character goes through, though, likely requires a lot of range from an actor. And, I, and I'm, I'm not an actor, but in this film, Scout Taylor Compton really, really shines in the worst possible ways. Crying, it's not an easy thing to do on command. So if an actor can do it and be convincing at it, that's great. But if they can't like produce real tears and you don't even like use eye drops to simulate tears, it just looks like they're scrunching their face and quivering their lip. And that's what happens with Taylor Compton's performance. She just constantly scrunches her face and quivers her lip and just drones on and whines and whines. And I get it. Trauma. It's like a child. Like a child. Yeah. Mm. And I get it. Trauma. But it's the acting, the performance. It's not there. And it's really aggravating. And, and I mean, whenever an actor can't pull off crying convincingly, it just pulls the audience right out of the moment. And she also has some really weird dreadlocks in this film. Just thought I'd throw that out there. Later in the film, or towards the middle, I don't know, there's like no structure to this film at all. Structure does not exist, and I couldn't tell you which part of the plot diagram the film was ever on. Anyways, at some point in the film, Lori finds out that she is Michael's sister, because she wasn't entirely made aware of that in the previous film. They hinted at it, but she was not, a, not aware of that. In the scene where she finds out, she just throws a tantrum, and Taylor Compton's performance in that scene was especially just so bad. She stood on her front porch and like screamed. She was like, my brother is Michael Myers or something oh, like yeah, that. Oh yeah, because like, they went out drinking. Yeah. Because she, yeah, I mean, after learning that, I I get it. You'd probably want to want to drink off that, uh, that traumatizing piece of news. Yeah. But still. The performance. Awful. Not there. The previous film's depiction of Lori was already an insult to the original. How her character arc in this film ends, though... So, you know, she learned she's Michael's sister. We also learned why, why Michael was hunting her. It's not just to kill her. No, that's, that's too simple. But to perform some ritual, I guess, to make her like him. Michael almost performs the ritual in a shed in the middle of nowhere towards the... Like, it's the finale of the movie. And the police have the place surrounded. More on this final scene soon but with Lori specifically it ends with her basically acting like michael just for a moment and even though the sheriff is like demanding them to hold their fire they shoot her anyways and then there's terrible freeze frames and then the the scene it takes forever to fade and then we see Lori sitting in a solid white hospital room and it's intentionally like made to look abnormally like long because it's not entirely supposed to be real like it's another like ambiguous dream sequence it's the closing scene and in this long hallway hospital room Lori sees deborah myers on a white horse which was mentioned in the opening scene because i guess rob zombie wanted to give foreshadowing a try in this film whatever the fact that Lori's character arc involved no possible overcoming of trauma and just her i guess dying anyways either way she ends up not overcoming anything succumbs to the evil of her family and it really really just, just just hammers it into the heads of the audience that rob zombie lacks understanding dr loomis he's kind of in this movie he wrote a book about michael in the previous film and in this film he writes another one and his character is criticized by the public for basically giving up on michael and then profiting off of him and you know People being upset about that makes sense. It's just what doesn't make sense is that they had Dr. Loomis give up on Michael instead of relentlessly trying to stop him, like Donald Pleasance, and then profiting off of him? Like, that 
It did not make any sense. At that point, this level of difference with Loomis, it's too far, and it's not Malcolm McDowell just doing his own approach. It's just bad writing and a bad depiction of the character. It just was no longer Loomis. No, it wasn't. And in this, he's kind of just a greedy douchebag Yeah. up until the finale where he goes to that shack to try and lure Michael out and basically a last-second attempt at a redemption arc. Like but he can do anything though. Like no, I'm pretty help. sure. I'm pretty sure Michael kills him. Yeah, because he like throws him through the shack. He rips Michael's head. Not head. He rips Michael's mask off, and we see we see his face clear Completely. as day. And no, and then Michael speaks. Sure, he just simply says the word "die," but he speaks. Speaking of. Michael's mask being ripped off and speaking and that just being the last straw of Rob Zombie's understanding of Michael the entire movie he he is in the mechanics coverall but then he puts on like 500 jackets and keeps his mask off for a good majority and up until the ending his face is a little obscured but it's still pretty clearly there so for the majority of this film Michael, he just looks like a giant bearded hobo. And his mask gets, like, torn half off in one truly disgusting and unwatchable murder scene. So when Michael isn't wearing his mask, he's just a giant bearded hobo. But whenever he does have his mask on, it's half not even there. Halloween Resurrection already took the franchise past the point of recognition. Then Rob Zombie's remake made it even more unrecognizable. Then his sequel was even worse, so much so that it just, it wasn't a Halloween movie. And I genuinely feel like this one is the worst in the series. It feels less like a Michael Myers story than Season of the Witch did. On top of every misunderstanding of how characters should be portrayed, Rob Zombie just displays that he doesn't seem to know the surface level fundamentals of making a movie his two movies lack any structure the cinematography and editing are nausea inducing and then there's the over the top even more nausea inducing violence at this point in the series it should have been the end of it completely there was so many points where the franchise should have ended while it was ahead or just die and let its candle burn out and move on with this being the third film in a row to be unrecognizable from a Halloween film and the fifth in a row to not even come out in October really should just end here. Now, Dimension Films, they produced many of the post-Carpenter entries in the series. However, after projects that were meant to follow up, the two Rob Zombie films never saw the light of day. That meant that Dimension lost the rights to the intellectual property and they were later obtained by Blumhouse, which seems like a red flag only after being very disappointed with the way Michael Myers was portrayed in the two previous films. John Carpenter decided to return and help Blumhouse make Michael Myers more terrifying than the remakes and more in line with the original film, which... Let's be honest, if John Carpenter wasn't there to help Blumhouse, it wouldn't... Maybe. It wouldn't have worked. But John Carpenter willing to come back... That's a good sign. David Gordon Green and Danny McBride pitched Blumhouse and John Carpenter their idea, and it was accepted. David Gordon Green was set to direct the film. And not only did the next film see the return of John Carpenter or Nick Castle back in the coveralls and William Shatner mask, but also the return of Jamie Lee Curtis once again with Halloween. Released nine years after Rob Zombie's Halloween 2, which makes it the longest gap between films in the series, on October 19th, 2018 so already on a uh, uh, back on a better track you know they're at least releasing it in october again y that that shouldn't have to be spoken you know like it's a halloween movie just released in october anyways this film similarly to h2o does not tie into any of the previous films in the series however unlike h2o this film only connects to john carpenter's original film Therefore, the events that unfold in Halloween 2, the reveal that Michael and Lori are brother and sister, not in this continuity. Lori dies off screen and leaves her young daughter to be taken by the cult that cursed Michael Myers to be an emotionless killer. 
Not in this continuity. Lori has a son and a fake identity, but then accidentally kills a police officer thinking it was Michael, but it actually wasn't, and then she's tricked into being thrown off a roof by him, and then Buster Rhymes electrocutes him to death. Not in this continuity. When I said that H2O was like a subtle breath of fresh air, and in only a few ways, but not completely, since the film overall, it's, it wasn't that great. Not the case with Halloween 2018. This movie feels like a breath of fresh air in every way because, I don't know, I think this movie's actually pretty good. For what it is, it's not bad. Yeah, and I've, 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 always, I've always liked this one. And I feel like David Gordon Green did a great job at making this movie feel like more in line with the original, but he still wasn't replicating or copying John, John Carpenter's uh, directing. Yeah. Not only did John Carpenter return as producer on this film, but he also collaborated on the score with his son, Cody Carpenter. And I think the score to this one is fantastic. It's pretty good. The film opens with two British people, a couple named Dana and Aaron, explaining what happened on the night of Halloween in Haddonfield, 1978. It's implied that they're investigative journalists doing a podcast on Michael Myers as they're at Smith's Grove prepping to visit him in person. Now, Michael's new doctor warns uh, Aaron just before he approaches Michael not to cross the yellow like square line that Michael is standing in the middle of. And uh, so Aaron tries speaking to Michael, but he remains with his back turned toward him with no response until Aaron pulls the old mask out from his bag and holds it up to him. And, you know, the guard dogs and the other surrounding patients, they start to react erratically. And even Michael just slightly turns his head. Then the opening titles. The old theme song with the same style title sequence as the original with a chilling opening scene is great. After visiting Michael, Dana and Aaron find Lori and bribe her with $3,000 to interview her, which seems a little excessive, but whatever. In this film, 40 years after Michael killed her friends and attempted to kill her as well, Lori is a paranoid shut-in. It is revealed in her interview with Aaron and Dana that she has had a few failed marriages and had her daughter, Karen, taken away from her for unsafe conditions. However, the way Lori sees it, she was preparing her daughter for the day Michael may return. We are shown that Lori now has a teenage granddaughter, Allison, who wants to be close to Lori, but Karen is not a fan of that idea. After Allison invites Lori to a family dinner, Lori breaks down because she saw Michael being transferred from Smith's Grove. She isn't sure what she's feeling, if it's closure or fear that it's it's not the last time she'll see Michael Myers. She makes a scene at the restaurant in front of Allison's boyfriend, Cameron. Once they calm Lori down, Karen explains to Allison what her childhood was like being raised by Lori. Mostly a lot of training, like tactical training, all for the possibility that Karen didn't believe or didn't want to believe could happen. Spoiler alert, the bus that Michael was being transferred on crashes and he steals some innocent guy's car and makes his way home to Haddonfield. On the morning of October 31st, Michael finds Aaron and Dana at his sister's old grave and he follows them to a gas station where he kills the mechanic and takes his coveralls. He then kills Aaron and Dana both. In a very chillingly shot and edited sequence, Michael retrieves his old tattered mask from their car and puts it on. Lori learns of the bus crash that afternoon and is stricken with paranoia and tries to convince Karen and her husband to find Allison, not let her go to her school Halloween dance, and hide out in her well-booby-trapped home. Karen and her husband refuse at first, and Lori is hell-bent on finding Michael and killing him before he goes on another Halloween killing spree. In an incredibly well-shot and incredibly well-composed sequence of Michael creeping around a neighborhood and going through different homes, this scene demonstrates that David Gordon Green clearly understood that atmosphere is better for a Halloween film, Anyways, Lori and Sheriff Hawkins, they let Karen and her husband know that Michael Myers has returned and has already started killing. And they're obviously panicked as their daughter, they, they can't reach her. They try to, but they can't because uh, Cameron threw Allison's phone into like a bowl of jelly or something. So Allison is without a phone and is completely unaware of Michael's return until she finds that Cameron's friend, who she was walking home with, was killed merely seconds after she separated herself from him. Allison runs through the neighborhood after discovering his body, looking for shelter, and some nice folks take her in and help. Hawkins and Michael's new doctor picks her up and takes her to Lori's home. 
However, on the way there, they spot Michael and Hawkins attempts to kill him, only for the doctor to attack Hawkins and leave him for dead. The doctor takes Michael and Alice into Lori's house. As, as the doctor, he explains that he wants to see Michael in the wild. Basically, he wants to be the catalyst for Michael and Lori's final showdown. However, just a little ways down the road from Lori's home, Michael crushes the doctor's head like a grape. Allison, though, she stupidly doesn't get in the driver's seat of the empty car and try to run over Michael and then drive away to safety. Now, she stupidly runs out of the car into the empty, dark woods alone with Michael untamed. I'll admit that was dumb. So Michael makes his way to Lori's home and kills the two cops outside, as well as Karen's husband. Lori locks Karen in the basement and fights Michael in her booby-trapped, home-alone-styled house. A lot of people really find that part of the movie to be kind of stupid. I don't fully get that. I have always thought that aspect was really cool. And it makes sense. Like, if her home wasn't booby-trapped, what was she doing those 40 years preparing? Yeah, and what else could she use against him? Like Other than just trapping him. Yeah, she... Because he, he vanishes. Needed to use her resources and take advantage of trapping him in her house. Yeah, and I, I thought it was cool. Anyway, so Allison makes her way to Lori's house and they trap Michael in the basement and Lori sets her home on fire, leaving Michael to burn and die once, once and, and for all. all. The film ends with Lori, Karen and Allison hitching a ride in the bed of a passerbyer's truck. This movie was, I, I think overall, it was pretty good. And this would have been a great movie to end the series on. Honestly, 40 years after Michael's Halloween Haddonfield massacre, he escapes, so Lori burns him to the ground. No need to keep going. They had a really good chance to finally end the series, not just with one final scene that's satisfying, but with a whole good movie that is a satisfying conclusion. However... This film made a lot of money. On July 19th, 2019, Universal released a video announcing that the saga of Michael Myers and Laurie Strode isn't over. Announcing that David Gordon Green and friends will return for two more films. Halloween Kills, set for an October 16th, 2020 release. And for an October 15th, 2021 release, Halloween Ends. However, due to COVID, Halloween Kills had to be moved to Halloween Ends' October 2021 slot and Halloween ends moved to October 2022. So Halloween kills. I'm not going to waste anyone's time with this one, mostly because this whole movie feels like a speed run. This movie is bad. However, there are some aspects that are, I'd say pretty good. A lot of the best elements from the previous film absolutely carries over into this one. Like the great cinematography, Jamie Lee Curtis, the great score, which this is actually one of the very few films to rework the original theme and it not suck. Only where this film fails is everything else. The dialogue is atrocious. I, I cannot tell you how many times the line evil dies tonight so is said. So corny. It is so corny. And they probably thought that sounded so cool. And then having the whole crowd of Haddonfield citizens just chanting evil dies tonight. It, it's, it's annoying and it's a corny line to begin with. Agreed. And they just, they never stop saying it. So this film picks up right after the previous film, taking place on Halloween night, 2018. And the Haddonfield citizens start to catch wind of Michael's return. And we see a group of first responders going to Lori's house only to be brutally massacred by Michael Myers. And only God knows how he survived a house fire while trapped in a basement. Like whatever excuse someone can think of, it's a stretch just for him to just have half his mask burned off. Like it's ridiculous. And to see all those yeah. first responders just All brutally those get massacred. Poor first responders who are just doing their job. And the first, the, the previous film didn't focus too heavily on the brutality. Mm -hmm. Definitely not. But this not. sequence just gives away that that is exactly it what just, Halloween Kills was. It just really showed you that that's what you were getting in, getting into. Like, and just I mean, br brutal murders. It is called Halloween Kills, but it's just stupid that they made it about the kill count. Yeah, that's I agree. not that's not the impact Michael has. It never was. 
un until now. A bunch of the characters from the original film start to rally up and go on a big manhunt for Michael, led by a much older Tommy Doyle, now played by Anthony Michael Hall, for all you 80s film fans. You'll, you'll like that. Lonnie, who was a character in one scene in the original, he's like fleshed out more in this, I guess. Lindsay, who Lori babysat alongside uh, Tommy in the original, played by the original actress too, Kyle Richards, or Kylie Richards. I don't know. I, I think that's pretty cool. She came back. As well as the nurse that worked with Dr. Loomis in the original film, with the original actress, Nancy Stevens, also returning. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yeah. Legacies. Legacies. As Allison, Cameron, and the rest of those characters that I just mentioned hunt Michael down, Lori just stays in the hospital the whole movie. Nice. The majority of the movie is a lot of brutal kills, and the ending, though, just overdoes it, and it is just ridiculous. So, Lori explains that Michael is the essence of evil, and the more he kills, the more he transcends. After Michael kills Cameron and his father and almost kills Allison, Karen steps in and rips off Michael's mask. However, we still don't fully see his face. And I do feel like they did a pretty good job at like keeping it obscured. So Karen took his mask and lured Michael into a trap. And he was surrounded by just a huge mob of people, of, of Haddonfield citizens. And they beat the life out of Michael. He should have died. One character even shoots him like four times through his torso, but because he's evil, essence of evil. And he transcends. And he transcends because he kills. He somehow is not dead, and he gets up and kills every single last one of those people in that in that horde. In a terribly cut scene. Really it's poorly just, edited. Ugh, it's so bad. And it just, it, it's so, it's ridiculous. It is just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Basically, the ending of this film is Michael's evil makes him invincible. He won. And it ends with Lori leaving the hospital with the knife ready to end Michael's reign of terror once and for all. Find out what happens next year with Halloween Ends. So here we finally are. This film, I feel like, really had a chance here. It really did. To It had a chance to end this series satisfyingly and on the correct course that Halloween Kills, like, it it stepped over the line. It just simply stepped over the line that John Carpenter drew. That's yeah. it. Halloween Ends could have taken that step backwards. It could have. It could have redeemed it, but it, it didn't. It could have. No, it absolutely did not. And... The trailers didn't quite sell a good movie, but at least it gave us the idea that this was going to be Lori versus Michael in one final showdown. And they couldn't even do that. They couldn't even do that. It was absolutely dreadful. So disappointing. And when when I when we weren't even expecting it to be a technically good film, mm -mm. yet we were still disappointed. Like whenever we left the theater, I told you that I don't think I have left a theater more angry than after I saw Dark Phoenix, which is my least favorite like superhero movie ever made. It's one of my least favorite movies ever made. I've, I've often said that I'd rather die than watch Dark Phoenix again. I don't think a level of disdain has quite met Dark Phoenix's until Halloween ends. When the opening scene, like, didn't even include Michael Myers and introduced us to some random character named Corey. Corey. And he's just babysitting some like rude child that he accidentally kills. It just shows it how, was concerning. how much concern that the viewers should have while watching that movie. Because like that sequence, you know, it builds up and it makes us think, oh, Michael, Michael Myers is going to come. Yeah. He's going to kill both of these guys or something like that. And then when the kid dies and then the opening titles start, I thought, where was Michael? How is this going to tie into the rest of the movie? And. And what my brain sort of filled in and made me think, I I was so concerned that that is the direction. that the, I was concerned with the direction the film was about to go in, and my concerns were were right. And now, now talking about the opening title sequence, I remember thinking, like, what is up with this weird, pale, 
blue font. Like, I knew it was a callback to one of the originals, but at the time, I didn't quite know that it was a callback to Season of the Witch. Yeah, I had no idea either. Yeah. We hadn't watched them yet. <laughs> I hadn't revisited them yet. <laughs> but it has come to my knowledge that that was fully intentional to give the audience the indication that this film is going to be different like season of the witch except it's not different it shouldn't have been it's a continuation of michael's story it should not have tried to be different especially since it's the finale yeah and so what we end up with it's not an indication or foreshadowing this film's different we just end up with some butt ugly font Mm -hmm. and a really dumb opening title sequence yeah after the title sequence we're given some Really bad expository narration. Narration, which is just lazy. It's just explained that Haddonfield has been driven to madness because of all the paranoia that Michael Myers has bestowed upon them. And that he's still at large. He's still out there. Oh, and there's a four-year time jump. Oh, yeah, that's true. So Halloween Ends takes place this year in October 2022. The idea that um, Michael just drives Haddonfield to fear um, was introducing Halloween Kills, but... It it's just, not the first the series brought that up. Right, it's not. Like, it's approached in Halloween 2 and Halloween 4 and maybe Halloween 5. I don't remember already. They just didn't execute it very well. It has never Mm-mm. once been executed well. Mm-mm. This one just does it so much worse and completely dishonors everything about the original and what people have grown to perceive in this series as in the past, like, 40-plus years. And that, like, random Corey guy... Yeah, he's a main, he's the main character in this one. Yeah, not Jamie, or, well, Jamie Lee Curtis, sorry. Not Lori. Not not Lori. Not Lori, not Allison. Not Allison. Not even Michael Myers. Mm -mm. It's this Corey Cunningham guy. And that is something that doesn't often happen, but when a brand new main character is introduced in the finale of a series. You know it's going to be bad. It always throws off the flow. And it made Lori and Michael's whole rivalry, it it seemed like an afterthought when that rivalry, it was the driving force of the previous two movies to begin with. And now it's just an afterthought. I I can't really fully wrap my head around why they chose to make this Corey guy such a prominent character. Like at the time of watching the film, I wasn't aware that it was meant to sort of pay homage to Christine, which John Carpenter did the adaptation for. And I don't know if I'm the, if I'm in the minority, but I've always thought Christine was a really stupid story. A haunted car. And I get it. It's a callback to another John Carpenter film. But why Christine? Yeah, why I, for Michael Myers? I didn't even know that. And that does not make any sense whatsoever. Has no connection. That that That's why they went with that approach. And when Corey, like, encounters Michael, he does, like, some weird Ghost Rider penance stare. And then he sets Corey free because he, like, sees what he did. He gets, like, a, he gets a vision. He does he, the Ghost Rider penance he, stare. He basically, like, transferred his power to Corey. His evil power. And That's whenever what you, I got from it. <laughs> whenever you told me that in the theater, I thought and was hoping you were joking But that's actually what they did. And yeah, sure, uh, Christine, whatever. It's stupid. Sure, there's a purpose, but that purpose is dumb. But yeah, that's what they did. They actually had Corey be the new Michael Myers. So much so that he brings in like a weird sleazy cop that was like creepy around Allison. He brings him into like the sewer that... Michael was like cooped up in to yeah. kill. So he so gives weird. Michael someone to kill and that like regenerates Michael, which was <laughs> He transcends again. Oh yeah, because he ki- Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's stupid though, but yeah, that's what happened, I yeah. guess. <laughs> and uh they had Corey lure in that guy and then Corey helped Michael kill one of uh kill Allison's boss and one of her coworkers. And then it gets to the point where Corey takes Michael's mask, gets in a mechanic's coverall because he he work he is a mechanic. He obviously is a mechanic. Yeah, so it's his own coveralls, but still gets in the coveralls, puts on Michael's mask and kills. And that part in the trailer where Michael like walks into a room and Lori has a gun and shoots him. Yeah, that's not Michael Myers. That's Corey. It's Corey. That's Corey Cunningham. Mm-hmm. She's not fighting Michael. 
I mean, she does fight Michael, but in that shot specifically in the trailer, not Michael. Yes, they do have a purpose for having Corey become the new Michael and be his accomplice. But as I've said several times already, it is just stupid, like Dr. Evil level stupid. And already right there crosses the line far past Halloween Kills did. And, you know, there's Laurie's story arc, kind of. Yeah, and kind of. It, it, it kind of felt non-existent until maybe the last five minutes because she she decides to live a normal life. She buys a new home, and and Allison lives with her. And I, you could defend Lori's choice for wanting to live a normal life and not pursue Michael anymore as that her preparing for that, for Michael's return, didn't work because he still killed but so many deaths were caused, including her own daughters, that she just decided, I'm not going to pursue him anymore and cause more death. But I think that's kind of out of character for Lori. And I would agree with that. 40 years of preparation, preparing her daughter, and it didn't work. Wouldn't that make Lori even more fueled with vengeance and ready to kill Michael once and for all? Yeah. And if they would have done that, then... They should have gone in the direction of a Lori versus Michael, which would have been been the better story. And a lot of people have defended that they didn't do that by saying they've already done it, except it's never stuck. They've never gotten it right, because whenever they did it in H2O, it's really just the last scene. And they did it in Halloween 2018 until that was outdone by the fact that there's two sequels so it hasn't been done right like there's like four or three or four james bond movies where it's like a revenge story but it's never done right so i still want to see a james bond revenge story i still want to see a laurie versus michael story or at least i did i did we're just not gonna get that ever no we never will at this point another thing that was weird for laurie's story was how They depicted the town's disdain towards her and how they were just frowning upon Lori for not killing him and unintentionally letting Michael Myers go. It's that they were mad that because like there's that one there's this one scene where this lady's like because of you my sister was attacked by him and now she can't even speak Mm -hmm. because you wouldn't leave him alone. And we both were like, wait, what? He's the killer here. He's the one who killed all the people. He's the one who hunted Lori, who didn't leave Lori alone. She was just preparing. And sure, maybe that's them depicting that some people direct their hate towards stories they don't fully understand. Or also that they interpret stories differently and sometimes blame the victim instead of the perpetrator. Which does happen in real life, but Mm -hmm. they don't... Women in media, look it up. But they don't go any further than that past this one scene. And so it's just I can't even it's so poorly done and so not in depth that I can't even tell what they were going for. And uh, there's Allison's story arc, which is so (laughs) weird. (laughs) They they have her like fall in love with Corey because it makes sense. She sees that he's not a killer. Yeah, which is fine. That it's him, fine that she can see redeemable qualities in him. But the approach that she's like trying to fix him or that she can fix him and that he's not a killer. Yeah, he's not. He didn't intentionally kill that kid in the beginning of the movie. But after he becomes infected with Michael's evil, also, he does become a killer. Another thing is she was trying to or she was relating to him. She was like, we're she, the same. We're both yeah. out- outcasts in this town. I'm like. Not in the same not way. really. Which they do touch on, but not well. And and it's almost like they tried to scrape the surface of Michael's evil infecting Corey, now infecting Allison, because there's a scene where she gets upset yeah. at Lori and then blames her for the death of her friends and her parents. And I get why someone would, why Allison would be upset at Lori for that. But they don't go any further. They just don't. No. And I just, it just find it fizzles out. Yeah, it fizzles out in this so-called finale. And I just find it kind of off-putting that they had this promising character fall in love with the new Michael Myers. 
it's just an odd approach. Yeah. And I think, though, that the character that was done the absolute dirtiest, it was Michael Myers himself. Agreed. When he first shows up in the movie, I remember checking my watch and realizing it had been nearly an hour in. And after that one scene, he's barely even in it. He, I'm pretty sure he has the least amount of kills in the movie, but sure, it's not about the kill count. I know I said that, but, but it's just, Michael Myers. It's just the fact that he doesn't do, do anything other than sit in a sewer and transfer his powers to Corey. That's it. And I think he kills maybe maybe three people in the movie. And he kills that cop that homeless Corey people. brought to him. And then he kills Allison's co-worker. And then he kills Corey. So yeah, three three people. He kills three people in the movie. That's it. Kind of kind of crazy. And then there's that fight that you see in the trailer between Michael and Lori. It is so it's such a letdown because in 2018 she had all the traps, but in this one she has no traps yet somehow defeats him after like stabbing his hands down, slicing his throat. The final like the final thing that takes to kill Michael was slicing his wrists, which, yeah, that would kill anyone. But so it's slicing the throat, getting shot several times, getting beaten by blunt objects. Mm -hmm. I don't understand what exactly it is about that that would kill Michael specifically. More so than anything else that has happened to him in the series. And then because like Allison and Lori, they're like, he's dead, <laughs> but not dead enough. That is an actual quote from the quote from the movie. Yeah. They like strap him to their car and like a parade of the town citizens follows and they put him in a car grinder. I mean, cool. They're definitely showing Michael is actually dead once. But is he? Or as the final line implies evil does not die which yeah sure it just takes different shape and then the closing shot is michael's mask on Lori's like coffee table Lori kept the mask so is that implying that Lori is i guess maybe i'm reading too far into that it's just kind of a know. weird ending so uh yeah I mean, they did kind of play with the um, Lori turning into Michael Myers with her disappearing and stuff. Oh, yeah, there's that one scene where she disappears, like so much so that her chair is like, like leaning up against the wall. Yeah. Like what? <laughs> I totally forgot about that scene. Like Corey looks away and looks back and Lori's gone. Like Lori can't. She can't do that. She's a person. What? <laughs> yeah, like she didn't make any sound at all. And uh, so yeah, Halloween ends. It uh, it doesn't just cross the line past recognition. It gets into one of those jets from Top Gun Maverick, and it flies straight past it, and it doesn't stop until it explodes. The amount, the amount of times, this series has gotten past the point of recognition after over 40 years and it still repeats itself it just proves that history is not kind to this series no it's time to stop making these movies like genuinely i i don't even care if in five years from now on the classics on the original classics 50th anniversary we get another reboot that's actually pretty good because that's not gonna matter no we know that if it's gonna be good it's going to be successful because, you know, it's Halloween, new Halloween movie People in October. People just love slasher films. Especially if it's Michael Myers in October. Like, that that, that makes sense. I'm not going to blame anyone from that. I, I mean, I saw this movie just because it's a new Michael Myers movie in October. I didn't want to, but... You still went with me? Yes, I did. But even if they do reboot it again, and it is pretty good, it's not going to matter. We know that it's going to make money, and we know they're going to stretch it thin even more past the point of recognition yet again the original film by john carpenter is iconic and it's a classic it's a staple of the holiday of halloween but the series just can't help itself constantly going past the point of no return and then being rebooted now three different times only for it to always go back to an unrecognizable state, then it is truly time to move on 
from Michael Myers. Enjoy what we have. You know, like whenever Halloween comes around, watch the original, watch whichever one you like, and just let it be that. But at this point in time, it is time. But right now, it's time for Halloween to finally end. It's the name of the podcast that you're listening to right now. I see you listening to this in your earbuds, maybe. Maybe not listen to this part at all. Thank you for listening. If you're at this part of the podcast, thank you for listening all the way through. Yeah, thank you for making it through with us. If you skipped ahead, totally understand. I yes, do the same. We do understand. Have a happy Halloween, everyone. Or depending on when you're listening to this, happy Thanksgiving. Or Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Or if it's your birthday, happy birthday. I am Carson Bradley. And I'm Chloe Reichel. Clem, sign us off. Yeah.